Welcome to another episode of Behind the Now. Today, I get to chat with comedian, actress, and casting director, Leslie Wolf. Leslie is the founder and producer of the extremely popular Fresh Faces Comedy Workshop. As an actress, Leslie has appeared in shows such as Weeds, The George Lopez Show, Cold Water, and many others. Leslie also runs her own casting company and is casted for many great projects of different genres. Listen in to learn more about Leslie's beautiful journey, starting with the comedy scene at UPenn, to wisdom on finding your true comedic voice as a storyteller. Hi, Leslie. Thank you so much for doing this with me today. I'm so excited to talk with you. I'm so happy to be here. And I love that we have matching greens. I always love to have a happy accident with people that I'm interviewing with. Yeah, me too. It's awesome. So Leslie, you are a casting director. Um, You do stand up comedy. How did you get into this industry, into this path at all? You know, like, where did it come from? Uh, Everyone has such a unique story. So what's what's yours? How did you get to this? Well, it's so funny. I went to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and the first day of school, there was two activities. One was to get involved and get to know the Greek system. And on the other side, it was get to know the performing arts world. And it was so funny because as I navigated both sides, I was gravitating towards this female comedy group called Bloomers. And it just seemed so fun. The girls were so cool. It was so inventive. And I ended up joining that group. And basically majored in comedy in college as much as my mom (laughs) would like that for my (laughs) Ivy League education. Uh, Being a part of the comedy group in Bloomers just really whet my appetite for comedy and for collaboration because in Bloomers, you wouldn't be able to perform unless you would write, unless you would gaff, unless you would Uh be into the music. So it taught you sort of the all-inclusive... like the whole every uh, like every facet of comedy, you were writing, you were performing, you were collaborating with other comics. That's really amazing. And so casting cool. in in essence, because as you went on for the years, you'd pick the new members from the incoming oh, right. guests. So it was so much fun. Oh, that's so cool. So okay, so was this like a new group or was it an established group that you joined? Just like out of curiosity, it was an established group. It was around fifteen years old. Because as you know. I'm so happy to see how integrated the comedy world is now. But back in the day, it was a very male dominated world. Yeah. So there'd be these sort of male comedy groups, whether it was Hasty Pudding at, at Harvard or, or even uh-huh. Mask and Wig at Penn. And so these wonderful pioneering women like Joan Harrison and Sally Katz started Bloomer. So it was around probably at least 15 years when I, by the time I got there. Uh-huh. And ironically, now it's not only called a female comedy group, it's called a comedy group for underrepresented gender identities. And as the oh, world wow. evolves with gender and and uh, fluidity and things like right. that, the idea of any gender being part of the process is going to be eliminated, which I think yeah. is great. Although I felt extremely empowered to be in a group that was all women because you really got to play every role. Now, I did yeah. come from a high school that was all girls, so I did have the value there of being the captain of the lacrosse team or this and that where it wasn't left to the boys. So it was my norm, but for a lot of other women, they have to sort of take a a vice president sort of secondhand role to a man. But back in the day, it was very um, pioneering. Wow. That's incredible. So were you guys, um, so you were performing all the time and like creating like material from scratch and That's writing so and, cool. and doing yeah. a lot of parody. And the beauty of parody with comedy is it keeps you up to date with current events, current mm. trends, politics, things like that, where normally if you're not thinking about what you could parody, you're not thinking yeah. about what's actually happening. And I mean, yeah, you see that now with obviously Instagram and with influencers, there's so much parodying what's going on in the world that is so relatable that makes people popular. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. That's really like incredible experience. So um, and also what did you major in? Cause that wasn't like a major, right? I guess. No, I was an English major at the, with the concentration in creative writing. So I also had the joy of working with poet laureates and things. Yeah. I, I was a poetry concentration. I know that sounds so insane, oh but God, I am a poet. So, cool. so I wrote a lot of poetry and 
went on to my first jobs out in LA was a TV writer. So my writing and my creative writing at Penn did lead to that, but my minor was in theater arts. So I was always uh-huh. interested in performing playwriting. It's so funny this morning, the reason I'm late, my hair is wet. I took my eight-year-old daughter and my husband to do pars at the Grove because we wanted to do something sort of holiday-ish and yeah. fun. Uh-huh. And we ended up in this long line at Dupars and behind us was this lovely family, uh, an actor director and his wife who's an actor director. And they told me they had just produced a play. And I, I believe the, the theater company was called the Crimson something, Crimson Theater Company. Uh-huh. But I was so excited that. to hear young, passionate people about theater and plays because it is a, it's an ebb and flow that theater goes out of style and back into style. And I think mm-hmm. theater is the best place, whether it's stand up comedy, live theater or theater. Yeah. Um, to have the instant gratification of performance. Yeah, definitely. That reminds like, yeah, so much you're saying reminds me. So I went to UCLA and also my, my thing where I was like, I, like I was, I was like, um, okay, I was going to major in English. I think like English psychology or communications and English, I could just like, I've always like loved writing and like writing essays, um, and all of that. So that was something I could just like go into. And I also had a um, experience with, actually not yet. So, okay. So at this point, um, but I ended up doing communications because like I used to let you apply into that and I just applied and got in and I just like went with it. But, <laughs> um, but like to, but English wise, I love writing and I wanted to keep that up. And so I also, so I was hired to work at the writing center. So I felt like I was like getting that there. So I was always like helping Um, like working with people and writing different things and academic essays to like everything. (laughs) I love Um, that you're saying that because, you know, you came to my show the other night, which I loved seeing you, that part of me teaching stand-up when I'm teaching is helping people ameliorate and facilitate their writing, where ironically, it's so much easier and more fun for me to do that than to start something from scratch. Like, so uh, helping other people make their writing better, you and I hold that same love, but not a lot of people do because a lot of people don't have the patience yeah. to help other people <laughs> make their stuff yeah. better. But I think that's, I'm like, you might have to come be my teacher's assistant. <laughs> but that there is something so gratifying about that because you're not only writing, which is gratifying, mm-hmm. you're helping people communicate what they want to say better. Because a lot of times when we're in our own muck, we, we yeah. don't see anything. You need an outside voice to help you, but people don't know where to get that help. Yes, 100%. And like I've often worked um, with students on their college applications and like personal statements. And those essays are very, um, like very specific and like very personal. But it's so interesting how many people um, don't realize like what's there. You know what I mean? Like what it's really about. And you kind of have to like, and I love that collaborative process of working with them and like bringing out like, that's really, that should be in there. That's very interesting. And they think it's like nothing to, it's hard, you know what I mean? Like structure too. Like It's, per, it's um, perspective too. Yeah. I keep going with structure, what you're yeah, saying. And like structure in, tor- in terms of storytelling, like, um, like sometimes you just like, I zoom out a lot and just like break down the basics. Like, okay, what's this first paragraph about? Like, what is it about? what's this paragraph about? And then they start to see what actually like fits into what's like building a story and what isn't, you know? Um, And part of that too is helping people respectfully take out stuff that's not working. People get so married once they write something as if they can't be removed. But sometimes the biggest gift you can give is is removing something to leave space for the thing that will be better. And as as you were chatting, I was going to say, everybody's relationship with writing is so different. Uh For me, as a child, I journaled a lot. I wrote poems, of course, a lot. So writing always felt cathartic and like a gift where some people feel so threatened by writing or that it doesn't feel good. So it all happens with your personal relationship with writing. And, and, And a soapbox I've often gotten up on is I do believe that everyone's a writer. And mm. everybody's a comedian and everybody's a storyteller. Because if you have a life, you have all those things. Yeah. And part of the L.A. mentality is putting people into compartmentalizing people. Box this person's a writer. This person's not a writer. This person's a comedian. This person's not a comedian. And that's the one thing, if I could in my lifetime, dispel the idea that anybody is more worthy than anyone else of having the joy of writing. So yeah. I think I think writing is necessary for every person's catharsis and well-being because a yeah. lot of times writing is the only way we can get stuff out. Yeah, definitely. And um and like everyone communicates as a basis. So of course you can write, you know what I mean as well. 
Yeah. And like, has a story to tell. Too, because if you've been told that you're a either not interesting or not, or, or, or that's okay. Keep it down. We'll hear from you later. Kind of vibe, yeah. which many people have lived from that. You're sort of mechanically right. telling yourself that you you can't do it, and that's uh-huh. such a. I was almost channeling my mother. That's such a Shonda. No, that's such a shame <laughs> when people don't even feel that whatever their story is is worth hearing. Yeah, and that's that's what breaks my heart sometimes. Yeah, definitely. And also, um, I've definitely worked with students and who feel that way, you know, um, oh my gosh, so many, like they're engineering majors or they're like math majors and they just feel like writing is the last thing they like know how to do and they want to do and uh, like that they, they don't want to do. Um, and they have, you should see some people yeah. come into my class where they're literally paying to take a class, which is, it's a writing class. Cause you're writing your five minutes uh-huh. who do everything they can to say they can't do it, to say they're not worthy, to say it's for other people. And it takes so long to get them out of that mindset that they've wasted that time to do that. But the funny thing is you hold on to that so much because what would happen if you'd succeed? Then what? Like what happens if you're wrong about who you are? Then what do you do? So it's really What you're saying is crazy though, because there's obviously a seed of something there that they're signing up for the class, you know? And then like to take the class and be like, I can't do it. This isn't for me. It's so like ironic. (laughs) <laughs> but it's so funny. I had to change my own mentality because back in the day, I wanted to be everybody's cheerleader and really make sure everybody had this great experience. Until now, I'm like, here's the deal. If you want to do stand up, I will shepherd you yeah. there. If you don't, you don't have to. Yeah, so, exactly. Interesting. But, it, but think about how much it happens in other fields. People get trainers, then don't want to do what the trainer says. People get nutritionists. Yeah, I guess that's the true. <laughs> so, yeah, completely. More often than not, you're hiring someone because it's not something you can do on your own. Yeah. So you're going to need that extra push. Yeah, for sure. So talk about how your class works. How do you actually teach? So you, um, so this class is for stand up specifically. Um, and that's such a specific thing. And I've seen a lot of comedy and I worked at a comedy club before. Um, but how do you teach someone to do that? How do you, I know. So you say you think everyone has that in them. So how do you, um, bring it out? How do you like help people structure these like thoughts? Well, it's so funny. You know that I I forget the guy's name, but the guy who said you have to do something 30 plus hours to be a pro. It's like whatever it was. Back in the day, I had a mentor named Sam Brown. He is now deceased. Unfortunately, he had pancreatic cancer, but he was my mentor and he loved the stage. So his only dream was to do like 40 minutes every Saturday. So he got me on board to book a show Mm -hmm. so that people would perform up to his headlining spot, which would be like 40 minutes. And Uh it didn't matter when he was on stage, he was alive. He was happy. He was brilliant. And it was what running those shows, some of your favorite comedians today, you would recognize the Natasha Legeros or the Chelsea Handlers, the, you know, Tig Notaro, Sarah Colonna, whoever you love now, they'd come to these dinky clubs, whether it was Good Bar on Sunset or the Comedy Union and then the Improv. And I would watch everybody. I was such a lover of comedy that I would just watch and love, love what I loved and notice when it wasn't working, right? Right. So you, you notice when it's working, you notice when it's not. And inevitably, because I ran shows, people would ask me for notes on their set. So I was essentially starting there, helping people sort of do punch up and stuff. Yeah. And then as I was casting, and trying to help people. I love casting and I can, can be sort of scary as a casting director because I won't sugarcoat stuff. I'll tell people mm. exactly what they're doing that's getting in their own way. And people right. used to love that so much because instead of being like, thank you very much and like mm. never calling that person again, I'd be like, I'm sorry, you came in here and told a story about your new dog for 14 minutes. I don't have time for that. And like people yeah. need to hear like what, how they're getting in their own way, right, myself, right. myself included, of course. But I would notice people really just wanting feedback on their brand during these castings. So back in the day before it wasn't okay, there was a place called Act Now that would have people sort of pay to come in and meet and chat with casting directors or whatever. Uh I'd meet these people and I would fall in love with certain people, start using them in things. And they, I think it all started there where they said, Hey, could you teach a five minute class on how to find your brand? So here you are an actor trying to get into these things. You don't really know how to sell yourself. So people would come in and I would help people find their five minute sitcom, meaning after you'd watch somebody for five minutes, you'd know what their sitcom would be. Now that was back in the day when sitcoms were more like Uh the Tim Allen, Drew Carey, uh, Seinfeld kind of things, not sort of the difference of it now. (laughs) People just would feel so seen and so understood. It's so fun 
one of my first students ever, ever, Atsuko, who she didn't speak very much English when she first started. She took my class. She now just had her huge HBO special, which makes me so proud. She may not even remember taking the class. It was like 15 years ago or, or more. And I see a lot of people, Moses Port was one of my excuse me, Moses Storm, not Moses, Ford, mm. was one of my favorite students. And now he's got a huge, a huge special. And to see the people sort of go from taking the class yeah. to becoming very successful and not giving up. Now, not everybody does. Right. For the few people that become stars or have their specials is one thing, but each person would sort of take a different thing from it more about what's their brand than what's their comedy. Uh, so as that evolved, I would have specialty shows like my, you, my pen would ask me to do a show. So I created a show called an evening of Ivy league comedy. So it would be all these <laughs> a little haughty toddy yeah. writers, <laughs> people from all the Ivies doing their show. And then I wanted to really promote women. So I did the she, she comedy. And then ultimately I I started teaching and I just haven't stopped. And it's funny, yeah. there's really no reason for me to still be teaching other than it fuels me and I really love it. Yeah, that's so beautiful. That's awesome. <laughs> it's so, so interesting what you say, um, like brand. Can you talk a little more about that? Like how, um, yeah, like how do we each figure out our brand and how to market ourselves? It's so funny, Jenna, because so much of it is so simple. Mm. So for me, I'll give, I'll use myself as an example. Okay. I always think I'm the wacky, funny best friend. I never get cast as that. I uh-huh. cast as get cast as the boss, the total bitch, the lesbian, the this, <laughs> the head of the academic department. Because uh. the way I come off to people is that that's my brand. Now I could go in and try to convince people that I'm the wacky best friend, uh-huh. but it's going to take me three times more hard work to do that than to right. walk in as the didactic. Yale professor. I just got cast as a Yale professor for the morning show. And it was so much fun. Of course, they put me in this crazy Missoni dress that I had to have like 18 spanks on to fit in, but it was so fun. (laughs) But the minute I did the audition, I knew I'd book it because it's my, it's your, I don't know. It's my vibe, right? Yeah. Interesting. That's not to say you can't go against type and do something different, right? Look at Brendan Fraser with the whale and and things that Uh he's, he's doing. Look at you know, Charlize did months, uh, I think it was called monster, which I really, really loved. And I left when I read her articles about how she had to eat macaroni and cheese to gain weight. I'm like, I'll teach you how to gain weight. It's easy. <laughs> um, but a lot of people are really holding on to this sort of quirky idea of who they yeah. think they are. And it's, they're not going to, there's 17 other people who are actually that person that are going to book that. Before yeah, exactly. Them. I totally know what you're saying. Yeah. And so a lot of times too, with my class over the years, people have, I don't want to say lied, but they're telling a narrative that isn't ringing true. So whether it's about, are they gay? Are they straight? Are they in a happy marriage? Are they wanting divorce? Are they struggling with something like cancer? What are they? I will push them in class to sort of call out their bullshit and say, Hey, you're talking about your girlfriends, but I'm not buying it. Is Mm. are you sure it's a girlfriend? Is maybe a boyfriend? Is it maybe not a girlfriend? Or is it maybe you struggling with your own demons? Like, like I will really, A lot of it is, I'm not a licensed therapist, but a lot of it is my take on where their psychology is intertwining with their comedy. Interesting. Because a lot of times my whole, my raison d'etre or my reason for doing class is find, uncover the moments of pain with humor. So you're using comedy as catharsis to get through the painful things. It doesn't all have to be cancer, divorce, and coming out, but if you can really find the humor in the stuff that you normally have trouble talking about, yeah. that's where your gold will lie. Interesting. Yeah. Un- like, it's so funny. I know it's yeah. un- unpopular, although hopefully it may be unpopular to talk about Louis C.K., but he's one of my all-time favorite comedians. Yes. Yeah. And something came across my feed where he was talking about divorce, how great divorce is. You never have to worry about the end of divorce and divorce is great. And it was so funny and he was having so much fun saying it. And the truth is, Divorce is a scary, hard subject, but he's making it funny and ironic. So when you can make, when you can find the humor in the stuff that you would normally sort of not tell anybody, Uh that's, that's the goal. So I'm sorry, you asked me, how do I teach? That brings us back to the question, which is I ask them, what's the stuff they normally wouldn't want to share? That's the first Mm -hmm. thing we all start off with. So it's, the term is being self-disclosive. What's the one thing you do in private or you do in your shame that you can share? 
Now, once you share that private thing or that self-disclosure thing, it opens up everything else. Right. So it's fascinating and it really makes sense. Um, and it, and yeah. it's not just for people who want to be comics. It it helps everybody because it calls you out on your shit. Yeah. No, no bad language, man. But meaning like I may spend the whole day going from thrift up to thrift shop from San Dimas to Santa Monica until I admit that it's my little secret. But once I admit that, I have to own that, right? Yeah. So I have to own whatever that means, right? yeah. whatever that means. I'm, I'm looking for something. I'm in search. I'm an empty hole. What, what's, what's, what am I trying to fill? What, what special thing am I trying to find? Who, who am I trying to hide from? It brings up all these questions, but if you don't tell anybody you're doing it, you can't right. explore those things. Yeah. And also, yeah. And I like the, and just in general too, with all like with art, the more specific, um, like, it's like the more specific you are in anything, the more it actually, the, like the deeper it actually reaches audiences. You know what I mean? It's not like, not only like even if you think this is only me, that like, because it's so specific, that thing reaches more than like the general, keeping it like a general thing. Absolutely. And yeah. I used to have a little saying with my with my class, which is if anybody else can do your set, it's not your set. Meaning uh, if, you, okay. if, it, if you're not ultimately personal, who cares, right? Yeah. And, and also my class is all personal. Mm -hmm. I will help people with observational comedy because that's a great comedy. But for me, Mike, I don't know if you noticed that from the other night, but people are bearing their souls and telling you the truth. Yeah. But say Brit, who performed the other night, was asking, why does everybody just blindly love their parents? I can't stand my mom kind of thing. That's going to let 25% of the audience that feels the same way have a sigh of relief going, I'm not the only one that asks that question. Yeah, completely. And it's so funny because... I really push people to get specific to the point where if they're doing something hackneyed or something that I've heard before, I won't allow them. Not to yeah. say that I'm the comedy police, but if you're telling me how <laughs> you think your nail salon lady is talking about you behind your back, I've seen it on Seinfeld. I've seen it before. Yeah. I've seen Angela Johnson. I've seen it all. Let's try something that's just right. you. And also when you um, do that thing, that's just you, that's going to be original. It won't be something that like, haven't I heard of that or seen that? Like, you know, absolutely. Um, and yeah. When you go in as an actor with that knowledge of who you are, you bring something into the room that you didn't bring there before thinking, right. what do they want? What should I become for them? What do they need me to be? You go, oh, here's who I am. Does it fit? Great. If not, I'll mm-hmm. be on my way. So, I mean, I think that's one of the biggest um, sort of things I could tell a young actor, which is don't try to become the character. Let the character be the version yeah. of you that would be that character. And I know yeah. that's so simplistic. But it's so, it's so easy. Yeah. And it's so, yeah. And it's so much easier to do than feeling like, yeah. than trying to come up with like the idea that they're maybe envisioning, like, it just doesn't make sense. Like it has to just be you. you And that's why as much as I love teaching and I think there is huge value in classes, I'm not a big believer in taking too many scene study or acting or Uh, stand up or any classes, too many classes, because what happens is I get a lot of people who've gone through like the groundlings in UCB uh-huh. and ironically, they all come in with the sort of personality uh-huh. that's kind of the same. And it takes me a while to take it off. So it's yeah. all fascinating. It's yeah, fascinating. It you want to fit in that, the, yeah. You want to fit in with the crowd that would book you and that stuff, but then you want to be able to eliminate it when you want to eliminate it. Yeah. And that's, I've been a victim of it myself. I, I mean, I talk about it as a host and as a teacher and as a performer, even a lot of my stage time is pandering to the crowd and trying to make everybody comfortable and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, when you feel that magic on stage is when you're telling the truth, the audience is responding, you feel it, you feel it and it, it, it cements. And I hate to make this analogy, but it's like when you make a post and you get all the likes and you're feeling the likes right mm-hmm. away. When you're on stage, you can feel how many likes you're getting <laughs> you know, from the crowd. Yeah. When you're not getting the likes, you can feel the the quietness too. Yeah. So it's, I think both times are valuable to have on stage because it can't always be perfect, but right. you have to, you have to know what your special sauce is. Yeah. And then in acting as well, you feel it, you feel like when it's, when you're living it and when it's like not, you know what I mean? Like you feel that Absolutely. difference. Absolutely. Right and away. I learned so much as a casting director. In fact, I encourage every actor that has an opportunity to work in a casting office or work even for a day as a reader for a casting director. Yeah. Because we create this fantasy, like it's some magical potion. 
So many people come through and you know who's going to book the job? The person having the most fun. Right. Period. Mm-hmm. I say that to people when they're doing stand up too. If you're having fun, the audience is going to have fun. If you're going and going, am I okay? Am I okay? Am I okay? <laughs> yeah. You're done. Yeah. And I'm an actress too. And anything I've ever booked, I've been completely prepared for, completely off book. It's so funny. I got an audition the other day. The name of the character was Flatbed Joe. And it was like a Midwestern <laughs> woman at a gas station. And I think I come off as a Jewish intellectual. So I was like, I'm not, I wouldn't book myself as this. But I really tell all my students never pass up an, an audition. Uh, uh-huh. so instead of being my normal off book with my husband, God bless him, who tapes all my auditions. <laughs> I sort of did a sight reading and like read it from the thing. And it was very half-assed. I will be honest. And I thought to myself, <laughs> after I put it in, I was like, you know what? It's almost better not to submit half-assed than to submit. Although I do mm-hmm. say you should submit for everything. Cause sometimes it's like one line and you're like, what well, can you yeah, do? Yeah, I know. Yeah. But you're either, if you're not prepared, forget it. There's 20 more people who are prepared. Right. Like, yeah. The idea that some actors have that you should hold your sides or look like you're not fully prepared is a fantasy. Yeah. I, I, direct to camera. I'm telling you actors out there, no, put down the script, be, be in it. Cause yeah. we don't, if, if I'm doing your, my interview with you like this reading down, you're not even invested. Right. Yeah. And, um, would you say that though? Um, so like, yeah, from what I've heard a hundred percent, um, on tape, like you don't have that, but I have heard, I guess, um, before, like back in the day more in person, you at least like have it, you're actually, no, you're still completely off book, but at least like have your sides and like, because it gives that, um, vibe that like, it's a, still a work in prog progress. Of course, <laughs> I've that? absolutely heard that yeah. philosophy, but but perhaps it depends on the casting director. Okay. For me, if I'm enjoying the performance and you start yeah. to look down and read the thing, it takes me totally yeah, out of the performance. Definitely. So for me, as an actor, a lover of acting, a watcher of, <laughs> of content, I would rather uh, uh, in a weird way, people are lazy. They don't want to think there's more work to be done. Like if you're already yeah. work to be done, then that's great. Yeah. Now, of course I, I'm going out for just like co-stars and guest stars. I'm not going out for like the lead role. So maybe it's different when you have 27 pages of, of copy. They don't want you to be memorizing it all because they also feel bad. But <laughs> I've also heard from actor friends that people are getting really fed up with all the self-tapes and all, all they feel a little bit almost like the self-tapes aren't making it to the producers and stuff. Uh. Yeah, and what, I, hard, what I can yeah. say, say to people about that is it doesn't matter. It's the making it and submitting it to the casting person. Because I've seen people who have submitted tapes that are not right for what I'm doing that I then remember their tape for something else. Uh, yeah, that's I'm glad you I'm glad you say that so that you. Yeah, because part of the job <laughs> as a casting director is to track actors and like, like take note of that. Right. Like you do um, track that. At, not only do I track that, but the the service that I use to collect my self tapes is something where I uh, have all the past auditions. So oh, I literally, okay. I literally use old. Well, see, I'm very different. I will say this to you, Jenna. I'm a very unique casting director because instead of doing what most caster casting directors do, which is put out a casting, see who submits pick from that thing. Uh-huh. I handpick everybody I think would be perfect for everything from my head. Oh, I wow. may also put out a breakdown, but I'd much rather bring in people that I know and love and want to support than some stranger that I haven't met yet, which there are pros and cons to it. I've gotten read the riot act from some agents and actors that mm. don't like the way sometimes I do it, but I don't apologize for it because the I have my clients that love me so much because right. of my quick turnaround and I could do that because uh-huh. the process is so time consuming that yeah. sometimes they're like, we need this by Thursday. If you're like, oh, Sally, Henry and Frank will be great. Why would you go through all that work? Yeah. It tails out of school. But um, yeah. That's what sometimes your self tape is not going to make it to yeah. the producers. It's just not. <laughs> yeah. I love and- that you're saying that because honestly, um, that's everyone in life. You know what I mean? Like, someone you don't know is not going to be in your mind like someone you love already. Right. Well, for me, I'll be perfectly honest. And, you know, you know, I, I have no reason to not tell the truth so that people understand. 
every behavior an actor does is remembered by the casting director. Mm. I'm not saying the casting director is so all powerful, but they do have the power to bring you in, fight for right. you, and put, put you on board. I have had actors in my history of crazy casting where they have said, Leslie, whatever you say, I'm in. Let me do it. Let me do that. Let me do that. Let me do that. And you'll see some of them are now big stars like Javicia Leslie and people who, mm. some of my favorite people who have done that. The people that, and then I'll have people who are like blowing up my inbox, asking me to help them get an agent. And then I ask them, oh, will you do this day of work? And they're like, oh, I don't do that. Like, uh, so then I'm like, no, not in a bad way. Yes. Thank you for that information. I'm not going to now spend my time getting right. you an agent if you say no to things. Like, yeah. I in no way think I am no way saying say yes to everything. You are a human with your own thoughts that you could say no to stuff. But if you have a casting director that, you know, goes to bat for you and they're in a bind and they need you to do mm -hmm. something and it's a good seg project anyway. And even if it's like a day of extra work, God forbid, for 400 bucks or whatever, it's the people that always said yes, that I have used all the time. And oh, I see what you're saying, which yeah. is not to say if you say no, I'll never come back to you. I sure will. But Everything that you do or your agent does is remembered by the casting director. Right. So, yeah, that makes sense yeah. completely. So I do a lot of kids casting. Okay. And of course, uh -huh. it was a huge challenge during the pandemic because uh -huh. I have certain clients, this is talking commercials, uh -huh. that will only have vaccinated people on set. Oh. No, no exceptions. But you can't post that on the breakdown because that's against SAG rules. On the breakdown, you can only say, oh. are you vaccinated or do you have a health or religious like, reason um, not to? Be? Right, right. Yes or no question. So then you've got the that's client over crazy. here going, I'm not letting anybody not vaccinate it. And then you've got the cute little kid that you put on a veil who is homeschooled and not vaccinated for whatever reason. And then you have to navigate how the agent handles that. Do they handle it with grace? Do they rip you a new one? Do they this? Every behavior they would do is valid and okay for them. Yeah. But you remember it. You're like, oh, this. And also agents become your friends because the uh -huh. agents that have the people that you love, they know, okay, Leslie's going to get all my people in for all this stuff. Right. It's, it's, um, there's no magical equation to it, but it's like any other business. If, yeah, if exactly. you had an intern in your hospital and the, and you said, Oh, can you go clean out the bedpans? So like, Oh, I don't do bedpans. And you're like, Oh, then that makes me have to clean out the bedpans. Yeah. I'd rather have an intern that would clean out the bedpans. It's, it's, that's a bad analogy, but yeah, no, it's good. That's true. But, yeah. But also I would bend over backwards and say yes to anybody who needed me. I've done so many acting jobs that I shouldn't have done yeah. because somebody was in a bind and they needed somebody to play this last minute because I, it's also a very stressful business. So yeah. if somebody is a movie that starts shooting on Saturday and the woman, this happened, I think in a Netflix movie I just did where I played Billy Zane's wife, maybe the woman that was cast can't do it last minute. And here you are, right. you're, are you available? Let's do it. You yeah. haven't even read the script. And then you realize you have to be on Molly and suck his fingers, but it was fun. <laughs> um, they're like, I don't, I don't think actors should be so um, precious about what they do. Yeah, like yeah. every experience you have to get on set is a reason to do it because yeah. you need people. And if you're good, you're used again. It's true. I love yeah. that. It's um, yeah. yeah. I've experienced that too. Like I've just, um, yeah. Cause like it could feel, um, it could feel sometimes like, it's just like a bunch of like doing all this stuff and like auditioning and doing this and that. And like, nothing like feels like it's going anywhere, but it's just like sent out and then you don't know what happens. Um, but like, I've noticed uh, many times now where, uh, I'll like, I'll recognize the name and I'm like, wait, and I'll like, look, and I auditioned for them for like a year ago when they were doing, um, like this tiny little no budget film, but now they're doing like this big film. And that's like, and I went, uh, and they're like being called straight to the producer session. And I was like, why would I be called? And you like, can and you like start seeing these little connections everywhere, you know? Well, that's a great thing you say too, which I could have done more as a young actress. And I recommend to all actors Every time you have an audition, whether it's commercial or theatrical, write down the director's name, yes. look them up, write down the yeah. casting director. Cause I keep that. I remember when I got cast on weeds years back and it was so much fun. I re realized that that one casting director always fought for me and always brought me in because mm. here's the real thing. If you're good and the casting director likes you, you're a benefit to them. The casting yeah. director is nobody. We're just the facilitator to bring in the people. If I know that if I bring in Sarah Fletcher, who's one of my favorite actresses who I cast in a lifetime movie. I forget what it was called. I think the haunting of Hill house. She's so cute as a button, 
Wherever I bring her, I always get thanked. She always gets booked. It's always done. So who's, yeah, amazing. who's the favorite, me or Sarah? Sarah is the one making me look good, right? Yeah, so exactly. Think about yourself as making the casting director look good. I know that sounds so funny because back in the day when I was doing much more like hosting stuff, I'd go in, uh-huh. she then became my very good friend, Carol Barlow. But I'd go into Carol Barlow and she'd always be so tired at the end of the day with her camera <laughs> and stuff. And I remember my heart would be racing and I just want to make Carol Barlow proud. And I'd go in and I always thought she would always make fun of me because I would always whisper instead of talk full volume. And she'd always be like, Leslie, don't whisper. And I remember being so scared. And we then went on to become very great friends. I actually worked with her for a little bit. And she said, Leslie, we're not against the actors. The casting directors are not trying to scare the actors. Yeah. It makes us look good for the actors to be good. So yeah, completely. I think that's why I became, before the pandemic, the kind of casting director who would help the actor become good in the room. Yes. Versus yeah. just saying, thank you, because that doesn't help me. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think everyone... Um, like not just casting directors, all the roles in this industry are trying to, um, they're all trying to look good, but, and, and, and on like looking good depends on the, the other roles. You know what I mean? As well. Like, and it's a slippery it's very, slope too, because yeah. you'll have some jobs where you do feel disrespected or you feel undervalued. And sometimes I could take it personally. And my husband will be like, do you know how many fucking things they have to do on set the day? They have to make craft yeah. services, right? They have to make sure the trucks are coming in. We all think our jobs are so precious. It's the only job on the production. No, nobody's right. thinking about your job, but you. Yeah, and that's, completely. And that's a hard pill to swallow because you want everybody to be like, wow, the casting's so great. Where's Leslie for her yeah. award? No. They're thinking <laughs> that actor showed up, that actor got COVID, that actor got that, and everything is your responsibility. Right. Yeah. And I also just want to highlight what you said um, oh, to track the like everyone involved in each audition that you yes. do. Yeah, because I do that, but I yeah. haven't done it forever. You know what I mean? And I learned I heard that, too, and I started doing it. And it's very interesting because you do see the same names coming up. And and like once I had a Zoom call back <laughs> and yeah. I remember like you couldn't see anyone that was on the Zoom, just like the other actor. Yeah. But at the end, someone popped up and they were like, Hey, Jenna, like, how are you? And I, and I was like, hi, whatever. And, um, and like, they said their name and they're like, thank you so much for always coming in and like everything. And then, and then they asked me like a few questions, but afterwards I was thinking, I was like, what? He, like he, that guy like acted like he knows me, you know, and everything's on tape. So like, I don't know. So I go back and look and it's like eight times where I've seen like, the same name, you know, it's and, so and, and crazy. It's your responsibility as an actor. I had gone out for a Super, Do- Super Bowl commercial a couple of years oh, ago where wow. I had to, had to wear lingerie and I'm already chunky at like, and 50. So I was like lingerie. So I was like, Leslie, get some lingerie, go in there. And I went in they're laughing. They're having fun. I'm going back. And I am i didn't book it. A woman booked it who had more of like a, once again, a Midwestern kind of look on it. It was uh-huh. like a woman looking in the, in the mirror for two seconds or whatever. But I felt I allowed myself to feel honored that I got a call back to the yeah. director for a Super Bowl commercial. I think so right. much we're just going, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Yeah. Like if focusing you're on, yeah. That far, and, and when you're talking about the, the, unbodied voice coming on your zoom. Of course, my daughter now is an actress and the same place is always call her in. And I remember a camera operator who I love was like, yeah, in that time I saw your daughter on the zoom one for whatever Lowe's or whatever. You don't know where you're going to run into people. Right. Be authentic and be real, but get to know the camera operators where you're going to cast and get to know the casting directors. Don't, don't be a kiss ass or anything, but yeah. Let them know that you know them. Like, I yeah. think that's something I tell my husband that all the time. He's in post production. He's like, I'm doing my job right if I'm invisible. And I was like, no, don't be invisible. Make yeah. sure that they know you so that you, they know they can't live without you kind of thing. So, yeah. I think it's a fine line too. Cause if you get too much, like if I get the 27 newsletters in my email, I'm like, ugh, like I can't. <laughs> but it has to be the right amount. Yeah. Of, awareness. So what is your advice for staying? Um, cause you just mentioned like newsletters. So how do you recommend staying in touch with, with any, like with these with people that you meet and you don't want to be like, just for the sake of being like, hi, I still exist. Like, you know what you I know, mean? I don't know. Uh, yeah. If I'm, I'm going to answer, honestly, I get so many emails. Hey, just checking in. Here's a new thing that I'm in. Mm-hmm. I am the type that will watch it. So like, uh, I like, 
I like that. Yeah. I'll watch it. Sometimes I'll be in the middle of casting something and I'll get one of those emails from someone, then I'll call them right in for what I'm doing. Oh my gosh. But yeah. I do like that. But newsletter-y stuff where it's nothing to you personally, I don't read. Okay. It, it looks like one of those emails where you're getting for like from the political yeah, like party. Yeah, like a mass. Like a, yeah. okay. But if it's okay, like, hey, that's interesting. thanks for bringing me in for Northrop Grumman. Here's a short film I did. What do you think? But you got to do it sparingly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I like that though, because you're saying, because um, what it sounds like is like, if it has... So just like, I mean, it's like anything, right? It's common sense when you think about it, but just um, like there's a specific kind of purpose, like it's a specific thing, not just like a uh, overall, um, yeah, I don't know. So like, like if you have something to share, like a new- Right, like if there's a reason. Kind of, yeah. And I do always recommend it in the same token, I really do recommend always be in class. And it's not, mm -hmm. class, my Philly accent, it's not just to be in class. It's because every time you join a class- You've, whether the class has 10, 12 people, you're, you have that whole new network of people that will use you for their projects, that will involve you with their projects. That's the real point of class. Yeah. Like class is great to learn a skill. And in my class, you're learning to do stand up. So then you have something at the end. But mm -hmm. whether it's an acting class or a scene study class or a stand up class, always be in class if you're an actor is what I believe because. Like you just said, when you're sitting at home and you're an actor and you have nothing else going on, it feels very hopeless, Yeah, which is another thing. I don't recommend that actors should only be actors. They should always be doing, mm. having their hands in multiple pots. Right. I opinion. love that. Um, and then I want to go back to <laughs> yes. something. So, so just going back, cause it's still in my head and maybe hey. I full, haven't, um, like fully understood the correlation yet, but so in terms of branding and like yes. how that correlates to you said like um, how you can think you're one thing, like the quirky best friend and, but you're actually perceived and get cast as this other thing. And it's a lot less work to come in as that other thing because it's what you're already perceived as. Yes. Um, but then were you saying that like the portal, like how do you, um, how do you discover that? Like, how would you advise an actor just to, to discover the thing that they are perceived as? And then, um, and then that's what translates to the marketing, like the branding of them. Does that make sense? Well, I'm not just saying this, but I do think stand up plays a big part in it. Okay, if, you, okay. if you, if you, you don't have to take my class to do it, but if you try stand up and if your persona is coming off as real and people feel like they're really with you, then that's a great step. Other classes like Leslie Kahn, who I love, they do a lot of stuff like if you can't get Julia Roberts, get Jenna. Like, like they will say who you're mm. in the world of. Like you, you actually do okay. remind me a little bit of Piper, Piper from Coyote Ugly. You're probably too young to even know that. I'm not Piper sure, Parabell. but I'll definitely look I it up. <laughs> You'll look her up, Piper Parabo. So if you were in Leslie Kahn's class or even my class, you'd be in that, you know, sexy runaway. Like you're, you're, you could either play the drug addict or you could play the entitled, uh, debutante girl. Like you're, you're mm. very versatile. If I was giving you, like, say we had a session where I do career counseling sessions where I help okay. people get their brand too. I would say for you, not for everybody, you could straddle both sides of what I call the status sphere, meaning high status, low status, right? Mm. So you could play the bitchy rich girl, or you could play the down and out drug addict, depending. I mean, this yeah. is what I'm, I'm getting from you, but for some people, they only read high status or they only okay. read low status. So it's like, if you, if you know that don't go into Dana Patrick and get super glam headshots, go to somebody oh, with no makeup. Same. I love Dana Patrick. You can still yeah, go to Dana yeah. Patrick, but <laughs> get your headshots with this shirt. Like for me, I'm casting this character. I'm not casting the made up glam character. Now, mm. besides my haircut, which I could, it's growing out when my hair is long, I can be a gorgeous, whatever, if I want it to be, but that's not what I'm getting cast as I get yeah. cast as the, rough around the edges, bitchy, gender fluid, you know, whatever it's going to be, because that's what I'm already naturally in. Right. Like no, that's so interesting. I, yeah. yeah. So in terms of <laughs> answering your question, the way to figure out what your brand is, is through class and, and through stuff like that, because you can't do it in a vac vacuum. It's only right. you can't so part of my class when you come in is people we do a writing exercise, then people write down all these words that make them think of you. Right. So, mm. oh, fun. She seems like a designated driver. I would love to go to a drink <laughs> with her, uh, school teacher, this or that. Mm. Then you get all these things. And it's so fun watching people's faces while they hear this. It's almost a mixture of like 
feeling seen and heard, which feels so good because it happens so infrequently. Uh-huh. And then some looks of confusion, like, like I come across a, yeah. a goody two shoes or I come across. And it's so funny. It is so funny. This happened this morning. Once again, in the line for Dupars, um, she's like, you look just like my friend. And she pulls up this picture and it was like a, like a really rough and tough like cow girl sort of girl that was just at the casino all night. And I looked at it and I laughed because we're never going to see our mirror of who we are. Yeah. We have a perspective of who we are versus how people. So she saw me as just like her friend who's like this like leathery skinned, <laughs> like like cow girl. And I was laughing. I, I didn't want to like make a comment. My husband was laughing too. But who are we in our own heads versus how we're perceived? You can't do that in a vacuum. You have yeah, to be in a can't class. At all. You have to have a teacher or coach to help you figure that out. Yeah. And I've seen so many people who are trying to like go in for the leading lady and they're just not going to get it. They're not going to trump out the 20 other leading ladies. So if you can mm-hmm. pivot and maybe dye your hair red or do something different or wear your glasses, then all of a sudden you're in the goofy buddy role and now you're booking. Yeah. Which it actually... When I hear it out loud, it doesn't sound like great advice to change who you are to get work, but you have to do it. Yeah, it's interesting. It's yeah, it's really interesting because you're also um, because like in terms of how you see the work, it's not at all like change who you are. I don't like I don't feel like you like you say the opposite, like, um, you know, like you do your version of this. Like, of course, like for me, I get cast. I just got cast in Fatal Attraction as the head of the psychology department. Right. Oh, my gosh. It's three lines or something. Uh huh. I, you should have seen my trailer. I thought I was Reese Witherspoon. They must have had somebody not show up. I was like treated like a queen. I didn't know what was happening. I was like, this is fun. But I got my hair done. I got my costuming. And it was just the whole process was so much fun. Then I did my lines. They did a lot of close-ups of the girl who actually reminds me of you, the young girl playing Ellen. Look mm-hmm. up her when you're later on IMDb. She actually okay. looks just like you and it's so cute. They did a bunch of close-ups on her, then did a reverse like one or two shots. I was like, that's it. But it, of course, I was just a supporting player. But I didn't even act. I was just being myself. Like the, the trick yeah. is, is when you're being yourself. Right. You don't have to like remember. Like it's so you... funny. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Some old movie came up with like Matt Damon and he was obviously doing this like really intentional accent. I forget what it was. It was Claire Danes and Matt Damon. I couldn't remember. And it, it was like old school, like 90s acting. And I was like, I'd much rather look and really believe somebody's the person that they're being than, of course, yeah. it's different when it's a period piece. But like I'm watching you know, Ben Affleck in Gone Girl, and I believe it's him. Yeah. Whatever that means. Right. I can watch him in something else and not believe it's him. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely. Yeah. And also it's just that um, like our day-to-day things, we're not trying to believe, we're not like thinking, we never like think of things like, you know, we just accept things and it's like the same thing in the work. Like, um, yeah, like you don't need to have all like this work, like extra stuff sometimes is like gets in the way rather than just, (laughs) yeah. It's so funny because I joked around about the Netflix movie. It's called Guest House. It's a Pauly Shore movie. And I was in the scene on Molly, which is a drug I've never done. So I don't know what it feels like to be on Molly. And when I snapped into the character, it was probably the more, one of the more fun things I did because acting is an opportunity to be other than it's, it's an opportunity to be something that you're not normally, but I don't know. I think it's easier. Like, who is it that always is themselves? It's so funny. I was watching something. I was like, they're just themselves. Like, they're not even acting. I think it might even be Brad Pitt. I always watch Brad Pitt. He's always eating something in the scene. I'm like, Brad, I get that you, your thing is always eating something to make your acting easy. But like, he never seems to be not being Brad Pitt. Like, does that make sense? Like, some of those popular actors are, are like that. Yeah, then that, like Jake really, Johnson also. Who to who? Jake Johnson. He plays Nick and New Girl back in the day. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I love He's that actor. always like, you can, you can just like know that that's just, you know. And I've heard yeah. him talk like, in a podcast and stuff as well. And you can, yeah, he's definitely just himself. <laughs> but that's when you really, yeah. it's true. Like even the intensity of like, I don't know all these people, whether it's Tom Cruise. When Tom Cruise is in something, he's in it. Like yeah. when you know that the person is in it, it's so much fun to watch. I don't know. God, it's I think because of the pandemic, I've watched so much fewer movies than I normally would. But when somebody, oh God, I of course you probably just finished White Lotus, did you? I did. <laughs> Wait, that's so funny. Why? I don't even know who, I think it's Megan Leahy's her name, right? 
who plays the wife of the jerky guy whose name is Cameron Babcock. Um, oh, yeah. played the wife. Yes. Her Blonde subtlety, girl. her acting, in my opinion, was so phenomenal. Of course, Jennifer Coolidge is great, but she's doing Jennifer Coolidge, and that's yeah. a bit. I love it. I, she's amazing. But Fahey, I think it's Megan Fahey, I'm obsessed. Like, every moment you could see her internal thinking, yeah. Just her like, life as the character. There was no moment where you didn't believe it. I thought she deserves major awards. Let's see what happens. But I think Jennifer Coolidge already won an award. But when I was watching that, it was her her being, you know, when they say in acting class with method acting or Stanislavski or anything else, you want to, you have to call back to a time when that actually happened to you. Uh, I believed that she was in a relationship with a man who was a cheat and she had to convince herself not to be a victim. Mm-hmm. I believe she lived that like from her acting. Now I don't right. know. her, So it could just yeah, be that yeah. she's a phenomenal actor. She might even be like British and I don't even know. But when I, when I see an actor really being real themselves mm-hmm. in the character, I'm so taken in by it. And when I, when they're not, I, 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 I call it out. I think yeah. it's because I'm a casting director. I'm always thinking, who would have I cast in that role instead? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, being yourself in the character or making that character who you are during yeah. that whole time. Yeah. And so um I agree. Yeah, she's phenomenal in it. And like and it's also um I love also just like like because imagine seeing that and like lots of things, but seeing it at first, like when you first get it and there's no context and it's just on paper, it's just on the page, and how many of like the like the go-to kind of things that someone could think of that. Like, I mean, the facts are this guy that you're with is cheating on you. And a lot of people I think automatically would be like depressed, sad, angry, all those things. And she's none of those things. It's um, yeah, it's very beautiful. And that's very authentic. It's like in real life, we like, I notice that kind of thing all the time, you know, like, um, like you could have a breakup that you think like, uh, uh, conventionally is like a really sad thing and it's often like depicted like that, but like you can have a breakup and feel differently, you know, like, and, and that's sometimes yeah. in acting it's called opposite choice. So you, yeah, you go yeah. for, the, for what you think it's going to be and you play the opposite. And all of a sudden the scene is so interesting yeah. because we don't all react the same to yeah, everything at all. Yeah. yeah. So cool. Um, all right. I'm going to ask you a few just fun okay. questions. Okay. <laughs> you. You're so fun. We'll talk about more movies later. Okay, cool. Um, what is your horoscope sign and does that mean anything to you? Of course I'm an Aries. Yes. Oh. And uh, I've always been a classic Aries, whatever that means, a leader <laughs> and fiery and all mm. those things. I love okay. a good Leo. Are you a Leo? No. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually on the cusp of Aries, I think, and Tor- uh, but I'm a Taurus. Oh, cool. But in I'm like March, very right? close. Uh, April. Oh, oh yeah. Your, your birthday's in April? Yes. What day? 26. Nice. And I'm April 5th. Oh, very cool. Yes. Okay. Um, if you were a professional athlete, what sport would you play and why? Well, I will say I would love to play lacrosse because that was a very important sport to me growing up. And I was like the captain of my team and I loved it. Right. When you're playing lacrosse, you feel like a bird because so much of the movements are forward thinking and forward reaching. And mm. metaphorically, that's something I really loved about it. Okay. Oh, I love that. I don't know. I wish. Yeah. I don't know so much about lacrosse. Like I've seen it and I can, I know how it looks, but I don't know. Like, uh, yeah, like the experience it's of East playing. Coast. It's more of an East Coast game, but the thing that's so freeing about lacrosse versus say field hockey, which is fun or soccer, which is a ground-based sport. Lacrosse is always, you're not even throwing the ball to somebody, you're throwing it ahead of them. Mm. So it's that feeling. I can't explain it of going forward and getting the ball from ahead of you and keep it's forward motion. It's, it's not, it's not a point, 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 point. It's a yeah. fluid. It's beautiful. That's so interesting. I love that. Yeah. Um, okay. And then how do you be the now? <laughs> you, it's so funny that you say that I'm so always above looking down at the mm. narrative of my life. And it takes a lot of effort for me to be in the moment. And I think the way to be in the now is making the other person, the most interesting person in the mm. room. Yes. I love that. And that's, um, that's literally how acting works too. You know, like you're, you have no um, self-awareness because you're so invested in 
Like you're and more at curious. The core of that, and, yeah. At the core of that is focus, because yes, sometimes focus. it's hard to focus. Yeah, I love that. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. You're really so, much so amazing. Yeah, you awesome. Too.